God for all who are here today and those who are on the line. We've got a few people signed in. I saw it this morning. It looked like quite a few. Uh, we're going to a Bible study in our early service, uh, our Bible study session. Uh, we're going back through the end times, uh, the, entire, the entire gamut of it, which lasts for a little over a year. So every Sunday, probably be about 45 minutes to uh, 50 minutes, we'll actually go to my old uh, video, which uh, I showed a portion of it last year, but I think people need to be aware of the end times in detail. And so if you tune in, you'll see our PowerPoint presentation with me speaking uh, in my office. I think it's pretty good. And the uh, PowerPoint is awesome. I've never seen anything like it. So I think it'll really be a blessing to you. Tune in early at 9 o'clock. So from 9 o'clock till about 10 o'clock, we'll actually be showing that. Praise God. How many looked at it today? Amen. Praise God. Really, you'll learn some things you've never heard before. So I invite you to, to join in. I think, let's pray. Father, God, we thank you for all who are here. We thank you for your word that's established in heaven. We ask that you would activate your word and take it from the realm of Logos to the realm of Rhema, that it might be tangible reality in the lives of those who are in the hearing audience. In Jesus' name, I thank you. Amen. 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 The title of the message today is Accessing the Invisible Supernatural Realm. And we're going to be looking at Luke, the fourth chapter, verses 14 through 19. And we'll also be going elsewhere after that. I really think that uh, we need to reveal what's required to uh, access the supernatural realm. And I think most people want to know how to do that. And I think following, uh, I, I'm not sure how long it's going to take, but uh, certainly today and perhaps even next week, you'll get an understanding and some insight on how to access the invisible supernatural realm. How many of you know that there's a supernatural realm that's invisible to the natural eyes? Yeah. How many of you have already contacted it before, as far as you know? few of you all have, praise God. Let me read uh, Luke, the fourth chapter. I'm going to read from the New King James Version initially. Uh, it says, Then Jesus returned to the power of the uh, Spirit to Galilee. And news of him went out through all the surrounding regions. So people knew that he was coming back, praise God, to Galilee, and uh, that he came with power and might and ability. Some had already experienced it in the miracles that he had performed there. 15th verse. And he taught in the synagogue, being glorified by all. 16 verse. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And uh, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on a Sabbath day and stood up to read. 17 verse. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place. In other words, he unrolled the scroll that they had given him where it was written in 18th verse, the following, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. 19th verse, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. The Lord Jesus declared the elements of his ministry and uh, by reciting the words of Isaiah the prophet who had come many years before him, uh, the prophet Isaiah described Jesus' ancestry and the anointing he would possess during his days here in his earth realm. Uh, Isaiah the 11th chapter began to address uh, the spirits that would be manifest in the lives of Jesus and by implication, the spirits that should be manifest within we who are believers today. Isaiah 11, verse 1 says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall uh, grow out of his roots. The verse literally says that the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, would grow as a twig out of the fallen stump of Jesse. Uh, that was his forefather. Jesse is his forefather here. It's stated very clearly, who was the father of King David. Did you all know that uh, Jesus also came out of King David as well? Isaiah further stated that the branch, which was the name of the pre-incarnate Christ Jesus, would grow out of the root of Jesse. Praise the Lord. In other words, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, would come out of the lineage of David. How many of you all knew that already? King David who slew Goliath, that's who we're referring to here. 
in the Old Testament. And it's confirmed in the book of Matthew, New Testament. And I'm going to read a portion of it here. It says the following. And when it talks about the book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Notice here it says he's the son of David and the son of Abraham. So his lineage included David is also David's uh, forefather who was Abraham, the father of faith. And that's something to know that we come from an individual who also came out of the father of faith, Abraham. I'm going to go to uh, 11 and 2. I want to read it again. Uh, no, I haven't read it yet. Let me read it now. Uh, this is Isaiah 11 and 2. Notice this. We're talking about the, uh, the branch, the Lord Jesus. Everybody say, the branch is the Lord Jesus. And it says the following about him in the book of Isaiah 11 and 2. And the spirit of the Lord, that's one spirit. That's the, the, whole, that's the Holy Spirit himself that's been referred to here. Shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom. The Lord Jesus will have the spirit of wisdom in him. Understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. The spirit, all these are spirits. They're seven spirits. These are called the seven spirits of God. These are attributes and qualities that would uh, attend to the things that Jesus did during his stay here in the earth realm and what he will continue to do and we who are submitted to him as believers today. You all have that? Let me read them again. The spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, we all should be baptized in the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Shall rest upon him, shall rest upon us as well. He said, the works I do, shalt thou do also and greater works than these, for I go unto what? The Father. The spirit of wisdom, we should all have that. And the spirit of understanding, Jesus' understanding. We should have that in us as believers. The spirit of counsel, we should be able to counsel individuals about the things of God. And if you're not able to do that, you're not fully developed. And might, might means unlimited potential and ability. You should carry that with you as a believer. You should have an expectation that when it's necessary, you'll be able to operate in the might of the Lord Jesus. Supernatural power will come and embrace you and have you doing things that are out of, off the scale, things that are out of this world. You'll be able to do it. Praise the Lord. The spirit of knowledge, praise God, and the fear of the Lord. Reverential fear for God. You can assess where a person is whether they're a child of God or not, but just watching how reverent they are of the things of God. There's a lot of people who call themselves Christians, but they're not very reverent when it comes to the things of God. Praise the Lord. Y'all are listening to me today? Yes. Isaiah declared that the Spirit of God would rest upon Jesus, the Messiah. Therefore, Jesus, in Luke chapter 4, is asserting his legacy and charter to a floundering world, saying the following again, in uh, Luke 4 and 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. We saw the sevenfold anointing that Jesus had in Isaiah 11 verses 1 and 2. You all recall that? In Luke uh, 4 and 18, I'm going to read again. Uh, it says, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Jesus was interested in the poor. God is interested in the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. For people who are going through a brokenhearted condition, that's why Jesus had come to help you, to heal you, to deliver you, to preach deliverance to the captive. Those that are in captive, a lot of people are, in cap, are captives today to drugs and things of that nature. And uh, some things we won't even mention here that they're in captivity to. Uh, he come to deliver them. That's why we want to get as many people saved as we can. The recovering of sight to the blind. That's not only uh, blind in the, the uh, spiritual uh, determination, but also because they can't see. The Lord does uh, support people receiving healing in their eyes so they can see. And you don't hear many people talking about that, but he's a God of the impossible. And if uh, you need your eyes to be healed, you need to trust him, rely upon him, and at the point in time, healing will come. Because it doesn't happen as regularly as it may have happened in the past, people just say, oh, God, I don't qualify. God, I'm not going to do that. They don't even pray. They don't even pursue uh, receiving the bounty that God says is available to them. The Lord has no respect to a person. So whatever your malady or problem is, he said that healing is the children's bread. So you have a right and a privilege to come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and grace to help in a time of need. Now, if you don't even come to the throne of grace, healing won't occur. 
If you let people talk you out of your blessing and the bounty that God has for you, it won't occur. So you have to do some things if you're going to receive what God has for you. And you need to be obedient. You need to be reverent towards the Lord and the things you do and in your life, the rest of your life that is not happening here in the church. When you're amongst your friends and when you're on a job, wherever you might go, you need to carry yourself as a child of God so that they can look at you and if they were to judge you, they would judge you as a Christian because of the things that you do and the way you carry yourself. And that seems to be left aside with a lot of this preaching today that it doesn't matter what you do and how you live. God already forgave you. You're going to go to heaven. No, you won't. <laughs> You're not going to go to heaven. Because uh, the book of works will indicate that you don't qualify for what is required of those who are believers. And the book of works are being written by the angels of God every day. The angels of God are capturing you. The eyes of the Lord that roam to and fro throughout the world, seeking whom he might show himself strong on behalf of the Lord. So they're looking for somebody who's submitted to the Lord that they can reveal to them the bounty that God has set aside for them because they're obedient children and servants of the Lord. So the people who confess but haven't really possessed the things of God. And so my job is not only to talk about the good things that are in the supernatural realm, but how you, get, how you access them. How do you get them? Praise God. And one of them is being willing and obedient. You shall eat the good of the what? Amen. Isaiah says that in Isaiah, the first chapter. I believe it's the 19th verse. If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. And then the subsequent verse we rarely quote, but if you're not willing and obedient, he said, I'll send a sword after you. I don't want the Lord sending a sword after me. <laughs> what about you? <laughs> Praise the Lord. So there's a requirement for us to live to the best of our ability according to the things that God has told us. He expects from us, we who are believers. Let's go back to Luke, the 18th chapter. Uh, he's going to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me, here's Jesus saying the reason that he came to the earth. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Praise the Lord. The Jewish synagogue, in, the, in their synagogue, the Lord Jesus made a few statements. Number one, uh, he came, his purpose for the anointing that the Lord placed upon him was to preach and to announce the gospel, meaning the good news, to the poor, meaning the beggars, destitute, and impoverished. And that's what we're supposed to do. If you uh, are ministering to somebody under the bridge, you tell them, brother, sister, you don't have to be here. You can be somewhere else. But you do have to, be, and people have failed to tell them this, but you do have to be obedient to the Lord. And you can't continue in the same vein you're in. And you're going to have to learn to follow some rules. If you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. But yeah, you can't be out here sucking, a, I don't know what they smoke on now, smoking weefers and whatever else that man has invented that's wicked to, to make you out of your mind take, and prevent you from using all of your faculties properly. Alcohol certainly has been around a long time, half drunk. Uh, you know, you, you cannot understand and receive the benefits that God has for you in that condition. So you're going to have to naturally make a decision about what you want to do. Are you going to stay here or are you going to come get up and, and follow me? And notice that in many instances, the Lord Jesus, before uh, he healed somebody, would say, come and follow me. Or after he, they were healed, uh, the next thing he'd tell them is, come and follow me. And so at some point, you're going to have to make up your mind to follow Jesus, not your friends, not your cronies, not the group you've been sleeping with every night. Uh, none of that. Living out, out in the open air. I mean, that's what you see. You know, I saw the tent uh, group, a group that was living in tents out there next to uh, the expressway there, Capitol Expressway. And I was taking my grandkids to, to school, and I looked over on the other side of the street. I saw a guy uh, going in and out of this tent. He had a makeshift tent that he had next to a fence. And I said, that's awful. And the way he looked, as if he was dirty and he was filthy, and he was young. And I was thinking, this guy is in his 20s, probably middle 20s. He looks awful, you know, trash all around him. And they had already gone through there and cleaned that area up. I can see where they'd taken all the paper and stuff out. But he'd come there and made it dirty again. And I come back down through there after I picked my grandchildren up from school. I looked over there to see, was he still there? They had torn down all the stuff he had there. Everything was gone again. <laughs> they cleaned it up. So I feel for people like that, see, you know, going from pillar to post. Uh, that's disobedience. That's all of that's disobedience. Because if they would obey the Lord and serve him, 
the Lord will take you out of the quandary that you find yourself in. And uh, when in, uh, I don't do it much anymore, but uh, usually I come off the freeway here, and they, they're always sitting there with a, a tag. I love Jesus, you know, money, please, or whatever. And uh, so I pull off the freeway, and I see these guys sitting half drunk. <laughs> some, of them, some of them look like they have their faculties. And uh, I used to stop, not as much anymore, but uh, there was a lot of outreach that was available, even through one of our pastors, Pastor uh, Calvin Cook, had a men's home, and he'd keep them there for uh, six months to eight months, but they had to follow the rules, clean them up, help them find a job, feed them every day. You had to come to the Bible study every morning, couldn't smoke cigarettes inside the house, you had to go outside, and it was always limited, those kind of things that they... And if you didn't want to do that, you couldn't come stay in his house. And there was a grant that he would get that allowed him to clean up and direct people back into society. But money dried up in the latter part of the, uh, actually uh, after that, if he left, the, the, most of the sources for grants uh, for that purpose were dried up. And so in the 2000, from about 2002 all the way up till the end, actually I would say probably 2004 to the end of two, about 2010, the money had really dried up to nothing, nothing available to help those individuals that was assisting them in the past. So I didn't direct them to those kind of places because <laughs> I didn't know if any existed. And there were a few, one that's still here, city team, that people can still go to, but they have rigid rules that you have to follow. They'll throw you out. Yeah. If you mess up in a month or two, uh, people, where's grace? Grace is we only have so many beds, and uh, you chose not to follow the rules to stay in one of them, and they, they throw you out. Or you chose not to come to Bible study. You chose not to come in at 9 o'clock rather than coming in at 11 or 12 o'clock or not at all until the next day. You come to eat. No, you can't do that. So the point I will make to everybody, rules are required in order for one to be a part of this world, a part of society. And so whether it's something you don't like to do or whatever, you got to obey the rules in order to be successful, in order to eat, in order to grow, in order to be prosperous, in order to... Be considered a child of God. If you go back and look at the apostles, they weren't like that. Well, but what about the, the prophet that lived up in the mountains and all that? I assure you they weren't dirty. <laughs> I assure you that they have rules that govern what they did. And, uh, and that the Lord blessed them bountifully, just like he wants to bless you today. Y'all listening to me? So he wanted to him, the Lord said he's going to preach or announce the gospel Meaning the good news. I'm talking about good news. You don't have to be under a bridge somewhere. You don't have to be living in poverty. You don't have to be sick and diseased. Praise the Lord. Uh, you have access to the Lord to remedy you from all those problems that you have no problem with. You don't have to be impoverished. You can have a job. The Lord will create one for you if you live the way that you should. And we have numerous testimonies, even in this church, of people who come from the bottom now on the top. So probably a few of you in here right now, how you can say, I, I can attest to the fact that I know how it is not having money, and now I have enough money to take care of myself. I have a nice, clean place to stay. My car is not the top of the line, but it's pretty good. It gets me where I need to go. And I want for nothing. I got a TV at my house, color TV, and uh, I got air, and I got heat, and I'm doing good. Praise the Lord. Com compared to where I was and what, and what my relatives are going through right now, because they refuse to change from the conditions that that the devil had taken them into. Deliverance to the captive in sin, sickness, and disease. Peter, uh, preaching to Cornelius at his home, had confirmed exactly what I'm telling you here in Acts, the 10th chapter, and uh, verse uh, 38. Again, uh, he reiterates some of the things I just mentioned. He says, how God anointed, notice here, God anointed Jesus from Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. We already looked at that, right? Isaiah spoke about that in Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. And we know what kind of power he has, the Holy Ghost power and all the other six attributes that go along with having supernatural power in your life. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good. He went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil, uh, for God was with him. If the Lord is with you, He'll heal all that are oppressed of the devil. Y'all hear me? And you should have that expectation in your mind that if you have a friend that's on the perimeter. I mean, start first. Don't start a hard case. I mean, if the Lord asks you to talk to a hard case that's strung out on drugs, living under a bridge, then yeah, go do it. 
But then we have other people that are closer to our brother, our sister, our friends that we need to talk to first to see if we can get them in. If they're resistant, then you go to the next person, right? And uh, so if you can call them and they still respond on the phone, uh, don't spend your whole day and your whole life trying to get them, but spend enough time where you tr laid the foundation so when they're ready, their mind works okay, they can come into the kingdom of God. So you went not about healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Notice that enemy oppression is what keeps people in the conditions that they're in. Okay? And uh, then we see Apostle Paul also made a declaration in Hebrews, the second chapter, verses um, 14, 15. I'm going to read from the King James Version. He says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, Likewise, took part of the same, flesh and blood. Jesus became a human being just like we are in the context of a human being. You know, and uh, so that he can fully identify with the challenges that we're going through as human beings living here in the earth realm. So that he was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. So he knows what it is to live in this earth and how devilish it can be and how difficult it can be. And he did that himself. He took on the pale of flesh, become fully human, although he was still fully God, so that uh, the high, he could become the high priest of our profession and he could stand before Father God on our behalf as our advocate. So he went through everything you're going through, the headaches you're going through, praise the Lord, he went through that, the problem, the pressure, maltreatment, family members kicking him out, talking about him because he's trying to do the things of God, same things that some of y'all are going through, laughing at you, belittling you, make, trying to make you less than what you really are, as a child of God who's been blessed beyond measure, they resent the fact that you got blessed because they haven't made the decision to serve Jesus as Lord. They hate the fact you have a nice new car, big old house, praise God, air condition, praise God, plenty of food to eat. They resent the fact that your kids are going to the best schools because you have the money to send them there. You didn't follow the route. I'm, can I just make it serious? You didn't follow the route that other people follow, praise God. You follow the right of the Lord Jesus. They remember back when you were young, you were laughing at them because they were studying their homework. In the, uh, in the attachment that was put on your house, I studied in our garage. My, almost my entire uh, uh, years uh, as a teen. My room was uh, the old garage, converted into a big... Uh, a room. The floor on the, it wasn't no carpet on the floor. It was cement. So my, the room I stayed in, my brother and I, was a cement floor with some bunk beds. And uh, I didn't have a desk to study. I had a plank of wood. A plank of wood and I found a chair somewhere in the house. And then uh, in the cold, Bakersfield gets really cold. <laughs> oh, it's so cold. I wrapped myself in a blanket. And in my teen years, I got about to 10th grade, 11th grade, I'm sitting in the corner. They used to watch me coming downstairs. We had a heater, but the heater was in one central location in the house. And nowhere near where I was. <laughs> and the doors are closed, so you don't get any of the heat. And so my brother, Brother Ricky, he'd always said, Well, are you always studying? <laughs> That's what he'd say. But you know what happened? It's funny that uh, he began to emulate me as he got older. And study also. He ended up in college, uh, basketball scholarship. He just followed me from then on. Came up to the Bay Area, got him a place to stay, finished with a high degree in, uh, in college. And so in, in, uh, even uh, my wife's brother, for a while he came up to the Bay. He stayed for quite a while too. Uh, because they see that, that what God is doing for you and they want the same thing. So they know about your background. Because they lived it with you. And they can see, and they may not tell you. Uh, my brother told me. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Your loved ones come and tell you, thank you for being who you are. Thank you for embracing Jesus. And then they do the same thing. They embrace, embrace Jesus. Begin to preach the gospel. 
they get the rest of our relatives getting them saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. So live for the Lord the way you should. Be an example. Praise God. A chosen one of Christ. So when people see you, you're set aside and you're different. There's a distinction that's in you that doesn't exist in the average person. And they need to see that distinction. They need to see that special anointing that God has placed on you, knowing that their background is the same as mine. If I do the right thing, I can grow in that same level. Praise the Lord. So let me finish this. I don't think, I don't know if I've finished it. Hebrews 2 and 14 uh, says, For as much then as children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself, the Lord Jesus, likewise took part of the same, that through death, through him dying on Calvary's cross, he might destroy him that has the power of death, that's the devil. So he died on Calvary's cross so he can destroy the devil in all of his works. And of course, he's not uh, completely destroyed yet, but he will be. One day he will actually be thrown in the lake of fire and he will burn forever and ever and ever. But uh, there's some tempting and te te temptations that have to take place in this life, and the Lord's going to use the devil for that purpose. And so if you don't want to be with him in hell, praise God, or in a lake of fire, uh, choices are given through the ministers of the gospel. Some of you are ministers of the gospel. Some of you are just basic people that love the Lord and live for the Lord. By watching you, they can determine if that's something they want to embrace uh, in their lives and to bring them into the kingdom of God, despite the devil and his agents being there to try and judge them and trying to deceive them in the following uh, their directions. And there's a lot of deception that takes place in this world today. And some of the people look good. You know, I was talking about all the blessings that come with serving the Lord, but the devil also has some set-asides for those people who live for him, his minions and his agents. And so when you see them associated with those kind of people, you need to uh, help them to the best of your ability to see the things of God and how it is so much better than the things being offered by the enemy. The enemy will bless you for a while there. I call it a blessing. But in the end, he always throws you away. Just follow all these people's lives and see they may live to be 80 or 90, but you look at them in the very end of their lives where the devil just turns his back on them and goes because he can't use them anymore. They don't have enough strength and energy and the context have gone down because now they're 80 and 90. Nobody wants to hear what they have to say. But really, I mean, they don't care how, there's no beauty there because of the age and wrinkles. The face is gone. And she got a turkey neck and all that. I look at my turkey neck. So I said, my God, what age can do. <laughs> and I remember back when I have a turkey neck. But I have one now, I cover it a little bit. But I can't cover all of it. And so somebody that's 16, 17, you can't reach them because they're the minus and well. So we need to generate a whole new group of people, younger folks, that will go and be able to live the kind of life that the Lord expects and to influence them and in moving toward the things of God because a lot of people are driven by what they see, not so much what they hear and what they sense in their hearts. And so the Lord has a plan to help us even get the young folks so he can reach other young people and get them saved while they can before their mind is completely polluted by the things that are offered by this world. The Lord knows what's going on, and he's there to help us and at the point in time, he'll put someone across your path that's a few years younger than you probably that uh, you can develop and mentor so that uh, when you're off the, uh, the docket, if you're no longer able to do your job, then they just simply step in and do it for you. Y'all see that? Amen. Praise the Lord. I was singing, I was watching uh, last week, went down to Stockton, and uh, uh, Pastor Janice was preaching. And I was thinking she's one of the youngsters that came through our ministry here. Pastor, and I was listening to her preach. I said, Wow, that's an awesome word she brought. Awesome. And I thought about it. I said, Well, I'm a father in the ministry. Told her everything I know. Now, by regurgitating it, I mean, it sounded like I was speaking it. And I said, Wow, all this stuff I wanted, she got, she got it and beyond. And the people got touched while she was there. And so you get to the point where uh, it's time for you to retire, praise the Lord, to leave this world. You want to make sure you leave somebody behind, praise God, that you made a difference, that you taught other people about who the Lord is, that you taught your grandkids and those that will listen and let them know there's more than what you're going through right now. I was talking to my grand, 
son uh, the other day, and uh, they said something in his class. He said, you know, God is this. I said, what in the world does that mean? He didn't know. I said, who told you that? He said, it was one of the teachers at the school. I said, God is not that. He's not this. I said, you need to get in your Bible. Let's get you a Bible you can understand. The people there, and old perfect people that's 30 and 40 that should know, teaching the contrary doctrines. So I told uh, Kia, I said, babe, they're passing poison down, and we need to make sure we intervene. Give him an alternative so he know who Jesus is. Amen. They can't play with him. Amen. You know, who, who, who God is. And, of course, he asked me some questions about God and all that. Of course, I answered him. And I told him that, uh, I'm talking to your mom. Uh, she's going to get you a Bible that you can understand. And I told, I told her, I said, get some children's pictures in there that will capture their attention. And stuff. Yeah, at a level they can understand. Amen. And uh, so, that, as I remember, when I was five years old, that's what got me, is... Uh, Nehemiah, praise God, on the wall of Jerusalem. A beautiful robe and all that. And back then, they had the nice cards here they give you in Sunday school in one verse. But that was enough to get me saved as a kid, five years old. So the same thing, you know, they're impressionable, their minds. They, they, they want to absorb all these things that have to do with the world. And that's why one of my grandsons, and he just wants to know everything. And so I said, yeah, you need to tap in that. And she said, I will. So I've been watching him too. He said he asked me some of the same questions just recently. And so that's how you do it. You see when they become aware of their world and their surroundings, catch them early. The Bible says B time. B time means before the time. So you need to teach your kids B time, before the time, before the time that the devil and all of his agents become aware that they're fair game for him and his cohorts to go after. So that's just a little side. Say amen. The, uh, here in the Hebrews 2 and 15 says, uh, let's read the latter part here. Uh, the latter part, middle part of uh, Hebrews 2 and 14. That through death he might destroy him that has the power of death, that is the devil. So Jesus Christ went through the cross, died on Calvary's cross, rose from the dead, so he could destroy the works of the devil. Uh, 15. And deliver them who through fear of death uh, we're all in a lifetime subject to bondage. It's amazing how many people are afraid to die. And then if you say them, tell them something about Jesus, uh, anything about hell, they get mad at you. They'll jump on you, some folks. And the school makes sure of that, and the, anything that has to do with man's cosmos. You can't say nothing about Jesus, anything that's going to convince people in their forms to be saved. You're fractionizing. You're just but they can go and reveal all you can cuss word and swear words and, and, and damn the Lord and everything else, and that's all acceptable. And do it while they're talking to you, and you've got to sit there and bear that, that poison. But if you say anything about Jesus, they're ready to fire you. So that's, that's the world system. It's not fair and not equitable. So they can do what they want with their language and their verbiage, but if you try it, they'll have a scheme ready to fire you and march you out the door. The same door where they allowed all that other filth to go forth and all those different ideologies that are, have nothing to do with your job, contrary to the things of God. And it's a lot that has nothing to do with the job that they're working on, but they spew that to you. And you've got to sit there and bear it or leave it, leave the room. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 2 and 15. Deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Yeah, and people don't want to talk about death. They want to talk about hell and heaven. They want to talk about everything else. Because there's a fear that's there, and I understand it. So we have to use the wisdom of God to be able to reach those kind of individuals. And uh, with discretion, you can reach many of them. And for those who decide that they don't want to go that way, you'll probably never re reach them. Praise the Lord. Uh, so we, we saw the statement, the acceptable year of the Lord that Jesus came to preach, uh, the year of Jubilee, and in... Uh, uh, Leviticus, the 25th chapter, verses uh, 8 through 13, uh, uh, he says, uh, which allowed uh, captives to be, the, the reason, what it means is captives were to be released from all their bondage or debts. That would be neat that that happened here. They're trying right now to pass a bill where people who paid all that money to go to college can be restored, that the debt would go away. That's sort of like what was available to those who were Israelis. It's called the year of Jubilee, in which what would happen 
is that there's a restoration. Uh, they're released from all of their bondage and debts and providing for the restoration of their possessions. They or their family had lost during the previous 50 years. So here you had a law that allowed everything to be restored. So if you lost your house during the 50 years, the year of jubilee, the year of jubilation and, and enjoyment of the things of God, you keep track of it, you can go to the magistrate and say, uh, 50 years ago, I lost my house. And I was in slavery. I had to work for other people because I overextended myself. But now this is the year of jubilee. And as a Jew, praise God, my right and privilege is to have everything restored. The title deed, all of the land, everything comes back to me. Now, I don't know a place like that in the world today, do you? No, they're just trying to get back some money you spent for going to college. And they're fighting tooth and nail with all kinds of lies to stop from taking place. Now, use your money. Now they got all kinds of rules why we can't give your money back. For a good purpose, to pay for going to school that money you never had that you wouldn't get, money that they stole from your forefathers and using on, using on their kids, they don't want to give you nothing, not even a penny back. So I said, I said, some terrible folks. <laughs> God. They took all the money, passed the laws where I can't get any of the money. I was reading about uh, uh, people getting uh, uh, inventors in the early part of uh, the 1900s, inventing things, things that are off the wall. And then uh, the laws were written, so you can't get, you cannot go to the government and then indicate that this invention belongs to you. Uh, you have to find a slave master to take the name, and then from then on, that uh, invention belongs to your slave master. And then you can never pass it on to your kids. It's just, you're just done for. And if he wants to kick you out the door, he can do it anytime he feels like it. So, man is not fair. So the only place you're going to find fairness, equitable treatment, is through Jesus. Y'all hear me today? So I don't talk too much about it because uh, it just makes you angry. The best thing to do is, really, really, so the best thing to do is just put your mind on Jesus. What bounty does he, I'm trying to show you the kind of bounty that he has available to you. And there's a, the alternate way to get what is good and, and that which is wonderful it's through Jesus. You don't have to get it through the cosmos. You don't have to get it through man. And if he gives it to you, the chances are he'll come take it away when you least expect it. Uh, a new dispensation comes in, fire all of the managers, rehire new managers, and guess what? You're on the fringes without a job. I went through that. And with a company I'd worked for years and years and years. But then, because I wasn't with the original group, they laid me off. They laid everybody off. And uh, so, when you serve the Lord, he always has an alternate, a bird uh, that's in the bush that, that uh, he's reserved for you. And he'll bless you despite what's happening in the world that's around you. Y'all listening to me today? Acts 26 and 18. Um, we see the purpose that Jesus came in. And this is what he, Paul said about him. Paul the apostle who wrote the vast majority of the New Testament. Uh, here in Acts 26 and 18. It says, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness, this is uh, Paul speaking, to the light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. That's what had happened to him. He was a terrible person, but the Lord forgave him from his sins. And an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in the Lord Jesus and in the words that have been declared by people like the Apostle Paul. So the Lord wants to bless all of us. And even the Apostle Paul realized that after all of the terrible things he had done before the Lord uh, called him in to become an apostle. In, in Matthew 4 and 16, uh, it said, The people who sat in darkness saw a great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of darkness, the light has sprung up. He said, When Jesus came, light came. Uh, he is the light of the world. And uh, we also the light of the world. We who emb have embraced him. A city set on a hill that cannot be hid. Praise the Lord. And I, I want you to begin to think in those terms yourself that I've embraced Jesus. It's the same light that emanates from him, emanates from me, to reach out and, and, uh, and uh, impress those that are in darkness to come out of the darkness into this glorious light. Praise the Lord. I want to read this, and I think I'll stop. But... Uh,
There was a woman that's uh, referred to in Luke, the 13th chapter, 16th verse. And Jesus demonstrated when he healed this woman uh, who had been vexed with uh, what appeared to be a disease called osteoporosis uh, in opposition to the objections of the religious leaders. So the religious leaders didn't want Jesus praying for this woman, but he found and saw that she was in desperate straits. And then he captures well, Luke does, and Luke, the 13th chapter, 16th verse, New King James Version. Uh, so ought not this woman, Jesus is speaking here, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath. And had rules that restricted when people could receive healing or deliverance, and that was the Sabbath day. Everybody had to rest. You couldn't get healed or delivered on the Sabbath day. Man, I was always making some rules. You know what I'm saying? On the Sabbath day, you can't get healed. You can't do no work. Except they, the, if a cow fell in a hole, they had a right to go take the cow out the hole. I mean, this one was in a hole for 18 years. And then Jesus, you can't do that because the law says you can't preach and teach on the, on the Sabbath day. Now, is that crazy? Man, always had crazy stuff to stop the, the gospel from going forward. Made up stuff that uh, they try and apply to believers. Most surely I say to you, watch this. This is John uh, 14 and 12 to 14 again. He who believes in me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these because I go into the Father. So he didn't just stop with Luke 13th chapter, but uh, he, he made it clear that we're supposed to do the same kind of works that Jesus did. Um, and then this is, he decided he's going to pray for that woman, and of course, uh, he healed her, made her whole, praise the Lord. And you can read the rest of it by going to 17 and 18 in the book of Luke. Uh, the previous discussion is not sufficient. The Apostle Paul added an anecdote to ensure we understand the purpose of Christ's anointing. First John 3, verse 8b, it says, For this purpose the Son of Man is manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Why did Jesus come? He came to destroy the works of the, the devil. Healing of people who are sick. Disease, sickness, and of every form that we can imagine does not come from God. It comes from the devil. Back in the Garden of Eden, because Adam did not live according to the rules that the Lord had given him, and if it's taken of the forbidden tree, uh, sin was ushered into the world. Uh, and uh, Ra is what it's called in the Hebrew. So anything bad that is not pleasurable, praise the Lord, that came from the devil. And, and because of him ushering that in, it stays until the time that the last enemy, death, is destroyed. So death is a, a representation of what Satan brought into the earth in the beginning. Incipient death is sickness and disease. So all the variations of sickness and disease are really no more than death, a premature manifestation of what death is going to ultimately bring. So if you've got a headache, guess where that came from? Your fallen natural body, praise God, that's living in the raw, developed pain in your head. And that's why we have the ability to go before the Lord and pray for it to be taken off. He said, you said healing is the children's bread. I pray as a child of God, I come boldly to the throne of grace. Uh, to ask for gracie, grace and mercy in a time of need. I'm asking for grace and I'm asking for mercy. I ask you to heal my head, take this pain off my head, because you said when you died on Calvary's cross that you bore all our sickness, our diseases, and one of the words he said, our pains. And so I'm asking you, uh, as was stated by Isaiah in the prophets, Isaiah 53, he says that Jesus Christ not only took my sins, but he took my pain. Did you all hear that? Yeah, nasa means pain. Nasa is a, the Hebrew word. If you look it up, it means pain. So it's not just taking away our sickness and disease, but pain as well. And so we need to study those kind of scriptures and know that they're in the word of God so that when we're going through pain, we say, Lord, this is not supposed to be in my body, even though I'm living in a time and a period where there's all kinds of things that can cause pain. But you said you provide that to those who are those, the seed of the offspring, of Jesus. I come from the seed of the Lord Jesus, who comes from the seed of Father God. And so I have a right to appropriate those benefits. My father's father Abraham, by the Spirit. Praise God. Galatians, the third chapter, said I do, that I have a right to be a child of the Lord. 
Okay, and the benefits that came to the Israelis of old, mine should be should exceed what they got. Uh, Hebrews 8 and 6. Jesus Christ is the mediator of a new covenant built upon better, better promises. So we need to ask the Lord to come. Say, Lord, you said better promises, that the pain is supposed to go away. Healing should be manifest in my body. You said healing is the children's bread. So you made that available for us. So I ask you to touch my body from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. And you know what? The enemy will fight you to the finish. You're going to have to do the same thing. You're going to have to fight and resist the enemy, and he shall what? Flee from you. And so that's an individual affair. You have to find a way to resist the enemy, and he will flee from you. And come boldly and ask, say, Lord, you said this was for me, a right and my privilege. The reason why you came here is to destroy the works of the devil. Sickness and disease and all the torments associated with it came from the devil. Praise the Lord. All that came from Adam being disobedient to what you said in your holy writ. And he turned over the rights and privileges that God has given him as the God of this world back to the original God of Israel, which was Satan himself. And he took it because he sinned. He opened the gate to allow Satan to come back in. So I resist him in the name of the Lord. And I plead the blood over my body, the blood that was shed on Calvary's cross. Y'all see it. And that's how you have to, that's how you have to pray. You can't get before God and it's pity for it. Oh, Lord, you know I'm hurting. Yeah, you know you're hurting. But you need to lay some word on him. He said he looks over his word to what? And if you have a study and you don't know any of his word, he looks over his word to perform it. And so what you say, Lord, your word says this about me. So you need to have some word when you come. He sees the word, then he responds. And so we as believers need to study the Bible. Right, and then we need to uh, apply it to who we are in our circumstances and our situations. You know, if you have no problem with your job and, and the income and all that, you need to pray the bounty and the benefits in on your life. You said during the time the children of Israel were almost done, they had a set-aside place called Goshen. And in Goshen, all their needs was met. And in the same land of Egypt, the people were floundering with, with disease and all kinds of problems. And... Uh, uh, you just passed over because they were not covered by the blood. And you need to say, I am covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus. And you said, the covenant that I have today is better than the covenant of Israel of old had. That the disease and gnats and all of the plagues that went through uh, Egypt did not go to their part of the land. Because they were covered by the blood they had smeared on the top of and the side posts of their homes. And you need to smear the blood on the top of the side posts of your homes. He said, when I see the blood, I will what? Passover. That's what Passover is all about. Make the connection. The Jews always had a Passover celebration. That was a reminder of them that when the Lord saw the blood applied, that the, end, the, the uh, destroying angel would pass over Israelis that had it applied to the top post and the side post of their, their home. Similarly, put it on the top post and the side post of your home and your personage. So that when the enemy comes, he sees the blood, he go find others. Easier to pray. And so you got to pray that prayer. See, I keep tying it in. you got to pray that prayer to the Lord. Father God, during the time of the Israelis, uh, you said that uh, when they applied the blood to the top post and the side post, that you saw it and it identified them with you. And whatever malady or problem that the devil was bringing, it passed over. Passed over them. Because they were blessed people of God. I'm more blessed in them because I live in this dispensation of grace. So all these incipient death and problems and headaches and all these things are coming. I, the devil has no right to put that on me because I've submitted myself to you and made you the Lord of my life. So I ask you to heal my body from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. Forgive me of any sin or infraction that I've been involved in. Direct my steps, Lord God. Fully develop me to the full statue of Christ Jesus. I pray I'm yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I hope y'all picked it up. We're going to stop after this. You pray the word, which means you've got to study the word. Now, I'm not going to get into it today because time is uh, of the essence. I may get into it next week. Uh, a scripture that actually shows you that, that you need to have the word of God in you. And uh, you need to know what your rights and privileges are and how to pray what God says in his word with an expectation that he's going to answer his word even today in 2022, that he heard you, that he will answer you, and that you need to keep coming and coming and coming until finally there's a manifestation, have an expectation and a trust.
that God will bless you. I'll just say this. It may sound like nothing to you, but I, I looked at you last night. I, I, I misplaced my glasses. <laughs> it happens a lot. But this time, I misplaced my glasses. I looked through the whole room, everywhere I could look, everywhere I had been. Watch this. And I prayed to the Lord. I said, Lord, show me where my glasses are. Crazy. I went in the garage and looked. Every place I had sat. How many of y'all gone through this before? Yeah. And then I got ready to go to bed. And uh, this, this, it wasn't this glass. another pair of glasses like this. There's a piece of paper or something right here. A, a box is on my dresser. And I'm tall. And I saw the fringes of my glasses. As I walked in the room saying, I know you heard me. Please help. As soon as I prayed that prayer and got ready to go to bed, so I'm not going to look anymore. Behind the box, a little piece, maybe half an inch of my glasses, which was sitting like that. I saw them. I said, God, do something else. <laughs> I took it and I put it inside of my glass holder. But I had spent hours looking for these glasses. And next to the wall where the area you could fall down and you never see it again. And all these thoughts going through my mind. Garbage cans next to uh, cabinets that it could have fallen. And I went through all the garbage cans, pulled out of my office. I said, I'm going to find this thing. And I finally gave up. And there they were. So I, I'm just showing you how the Lord works. Yeah. You worried about this and worried about that. He already didn't answer the question. You just not, you need to rest in the Lord. Amen. You know I need my glasses. Praise God. Y'all watching me. I got to make sure I got the right color and all that. Praise the Lord. <laughs> no, no. We thank God for Jesus. I trust that you were blessed today. We're going to continue next week uh, with the uh, sermon, uh, which, uh, again, is uh, one that I hadn't talked about in quite a while, uh, accessing the invisible supernatural realm. I'm showing you how to access the supernatural things that God has for you, hopefully in a point, in a way that you can understand fully how to pray and put an expectation that God will answer you for whatever it is. If he gives me my glasses, certainly he'll take care of healing and, ho and wholeness that you require in your body. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello. Thank you for listening to this resource. If you would like to receive our audio DVD catalog or desire more information about our ministry, you may write to us at P.O. Box 612 8 San Jose, California 95161-2822 or you may request information via our website at www.sjwofcc.org We look forward to hearing from you. God bless you.